So I have this habit of getting like weirdly fixated on just like the most random stuff. And one of those stuffs was 2020's New Warriors, which for those of you who don't remember, was a team of like woke teenage superheroes that like Marvel tried to debut a couple years back, but was so unanimously hated for being just absolutely horrendous that it turned a finished product into lost media. And like while the stuff that was presented in that announcement video three years ago was truly awful, I can't help but like feel that at its base it wasn't an inherently bad idea and dare I say there's something worth salvaging here and honestly with a little bit of retooling okay okay actually like with a lot of retooling you could turn this into a legitimately great book and so that's what I'm gonna try to do today with the one stipulation being that no matter how much I change at the end of the day these characters need to seem like characters that actually would have those terrible names. Because come on, where would the fun be if there was no challenge, you know what I'm saying? But before we can start turning this ship around, we first gotta cut the crust off this shit sandwich by removing this redundant, lazy, uninspired, not like the others, so clearly created to fill a quota of a character. B? Negative? More like, begone! <laughs> oh, so stupid. Okay, we can start now. I think this character perfectly sums up, at least on a surface level, everything that was wrong about how they approached executing this idea. And why it feels so disingenuous. Like, let me get this straight. You created a new superhero team with a body positive member on it and then stuck them in a costume that hides their body? Why? It's not like Marvel has a problem putting their underage female superheroes in tight and revealing outfits. Not to mention that like the suits, these form-fitting colorful costumes are one of the primary appeals of this genre. And so when you're creating a new character, specifically one from an underrepresented demographic, you'd want to include those iconic staples in the design. So for it to feature none of them, it kind of just comes off as editorial, not thinking that plus size women are attractive enough to wear those kind of costumes. To which all I have to say is that one of the sexiest women I've ever met in my life is a fat chick. And if that person happens to be watching right now, hey, how you doing? <laughs> Anyway, the point is, there's no ignoring how fat phobic this body positive character feels, which is so contradictory to what they're trying to sell you on. And so one of the main goals I sort of had when reinventing her was just kind of making her look hot. And because I don't make content for creeps and scum, I'm also aging her up to 20. So that way she's still like under the restrictions of the outlawed event for which she was originally created. Beyond that, the first thing I decided to do was pick a decent color scheme because cyan, magenta, and yellow are not it. All right. And like, you know, I, I can kind of see what they were going for, but I wasn't going to waste my time trying to make it work. Um, and ultimately I settled on a sort of magenta and lavender mix, which I felt paired rarely nicely with the new power set I decided on, which is a, more of a gravity and space based thing because I kind of lost all enthusiasm for the backpack idea when I remembered that the new gods are a DC thing. And so those Kirby-isms in her design were just for aesthetic instead of like any like, ooh, we're tying her into like uh, this cool part of the, the, the universe, you know? But from there, it became very clear which direction I wanted to take the look. Something very uh, retro space with like the circles and the discs and just organic shapes overall. Making sure to incorporate loose artifacts into the design so that way we could portray a sense of like gravity and weight. Ultimately, though, the biggest influence on her final look was the reworking of her backstory. Now, when I think of the word trailblazer, the first thing that comes to mind are risk takers, individuals who have great motivation and are incredibly ambitious, you know, pioneers. And like, honestly speaking, influencers have those characteristics in spades, which is why I decided to make her one. Not to mention that I also think it's kind of a cute reference to like what the original New Warriors are most infamously known for. Plus, I just sort of love the concept of a heroic character whose primary motivation is not noble whatsoever, at least at the start. Laying down the foundation for what I think could be a really complex and compelling protagonist, especially when you position them as the team's leader, which she's a natural fit for because like, you know, you don't become the biggest e-celebrity in the Marvel universe by just having superpowers, especially when your powers suck, which they do. Trailblazers, or you know, to use her real name, Elu, her power is complete control over the orientation of her center of gravity, which is kind of useless unless you're like a bad bitch like her and realize, oh snap, I can fly by effectively falling upside down. And if I concentrate, I can basically deliver incredibly devastating blows by keeping track of 
of how much gravitational force would be dragging down on her punches. Now, while Elu is an incredibly competent and capable leader, to the point where she has like a better understanding of her teammates powers and how they work and how to use them than they do, she's incredibly cutthroat and conceited, often bumping heads with her teammates over the morality of what they do because again, she's only in this for the cloud and the cash dude, all right? The only people she cares about providing a better life for is her loved ones back on the reservation. However, as her relationship with her teammates grows, specifically a romantic one with Snowflake, their deep sense of compassion and justice begin to realign her moral compass in a more altruistic direction. And that's Trailblazer. Now look, before I get into this guy, I just want y'all to know that I have nothing against silly stuff in comics. In fact, I think it's an integral part of the medium's appeal, and it's something that I genuinely love about them, at least in terms of cape shit. Like, one of my favorite Marvel characters is a Great Lakes Avengers member by the name of Good Boy, whose power is, get this, not being able to turn into a wolfman like Wolfman. <laughs> no, it's, it's Man Wolf. Uh... <laughs> Sorry, like Man Wolf or Wolf Spade or Werewolf by Night, but is instead the ability to turn into their fursona, which is just like, ugh, just chef's kiss. It's perfect. It's beautiful. But internet gas? I'm sorry. That's just. That crosses the line from silly to just straight up stupid. And quite frankly, what makes him the cringiest out of the entire batch is that everything about him is like screaming Skechers superhero to me. And even then I'm a little hesitant to make that comparison because you know what? Z-Strap was cool as shit. <laughs> I'm not I'm not even being facetious. On God. I on God. <laughs> I ain't gonna disrespect him like that. <laughs> See, can I get? I want some C straps, dude. But their passing resemblance did inspire my approach to this reinvention. Okay, so here's my take on screen time. He's an algorithm developed by boomers to market to Zoomers that gain sentience and manifest himself on the physical plane via some insanely advanced experimental VR technology. Or in simpler terms, he's like, what if the um. <laughs> How do you do fellow kids meme? Like, like he's like the physical embodiment of that. Which is just like a, such a cursed concept for a character, but I, I, couldn't I couldn't resist, dude. Now, visually speaking, it was pretty easy to figure out just because so much of the conceit of the character kind of already dictated what he would look like. You know, you have to make him look like a kid because the whole uh, being born yesterday thing, plus if he's going to be cringy, he's a little bit more tolerable when it's like coming from, you know, like a child and not like a teenager and then you know like what was really fun about him too is the fact that because he wasn't human i could do some more cartoony uh proportions and specifically get to use on the legs um some design elements that i'd already like seen and wanted to use but like never had a character i could put them on and that, so that was fun and, and you know then from there it was just like playing with different visors playing with different haircuts specifically one of them if you're a big Jacksepticeye fan you might recognize um <laughs> but really you know it was, it was very straightforward the interesting thing with him though is he did sort of begin to set the pattern that you'll notice on the other team members which is that black white and then accenting colors now what I'm really excited to talk to you guys about is his new power set because honestly it's a major upgrade okay instead of being able to just connect to the internet like you know any smartphone he now is basically a green lantern ring but with a ben 10 battery life so while he's undoubtedly the most powerful and useful member of the team he also has to be very sparing for when he acts as their big gun as just standing around doing nothing uses up his battery and when he runs out he just sort of bloop, and ceases to exist reverting back to being nothing but a headset which from a writing perspective i love because it's just a versatile character quirk you could use it for great comedic effect having him bloop in the middle of an argument and having the other person basically hold the entire essence of his being in hand in frustration but also for great dramatic effect there's this scene i've thought up of that would probably happen towards the end of the run of him struggling to hold up a collapsing building as his power is depleting anxiously watching bar after bar drop on his visor as he's holding up this massive structure for all the civilians to get out and then just as the last group is making their way to the exit you see him completely hit zero but instead of him immediately blooping away like he always has he manages to do the impossible and through sheer willpower alone defies his machinery and keeps himself manifested on the physical plane shouting at the top of his digital lungs that he's not just a glitch that he's not just a bad string of code that he's a hero and heroes don't give up right as the last civilian makes it to safety and he bloops into his visor for the final time before being crushed by the debris presumably dying 
until volume two <laughs> where he gets rebuilt. Um, <laughs> now I haven't really settled on a name for this little guy. I thought about making it chip or digit or some other kind of computer pun like that because I'm corny. But the more that I think about it, a human name would be far more fitting considering, you know, his journey is kind of about him discovering his own autonomy, not just because he's an AI, but specifically he's an AI programmed by a generation with a far more binary way of viewing the world. But you know, all his friends and teammates, th none of them really fit into that binary. And so it's kind of him like discovering and opening himself up to the beautiful possibilities for the human experience and deciding what he wants his human experience to be. And that's screen time. Credit where credit is due. My guy is true to his name. He's by far the least offensive of all these characters. Honestly, there's not much for me to criticize besides the fact that his powers suck. Only being able to trigger force fields when you're protecting somebody else effectively means that when you're by yourself, you don't have superpowers. And his costume is trash. So let's just give him some new ones. Now, when I hear the name Safe Space, I immediately think of some kind of power related to preventing collateral damage. And the first thing that came to mind in terms of how to visualize that was the mirror dimension. So I decided I wanted his quirk to be an incredibly tamed version of that. An alternate plane of reality identical to our own, except anything that happens there doesn't affect the real world. Quite literally, a safe space. But here's a catch. Jermaine can't control what actually gets taken into the safe space. And so it kind of just ends up taking everything in, including civilians. And so he effectively has to run and kind of personally remove them out of the space himself by touching them, which I know is like a really convoluted power, but like, it's still better than what they gave him. Besides, it also provides the opportunity to create some really compelling narrative beats. Imagine the team is fighting an incredibly powerful bad guy, and he's totally gonna kill them if they keep going at it. So Jermaine, being the heart and soul and protector of the team, decides to effectively push his teammates out of the safe space, leaving him behind, trapped with the enemy for forever, because if he dies, I mean, there's no way out. But that's just the most dramatic application for that power. I think you could also do a lot of little minor character beats, having him effectively disappear into it, or having other teammates disappear into it whenever they get upset at each other, um, using it as like a cloaking device to effectively hide them from you know, uh, oncoming enemies, whatever. I don't know. Get creative with it. Now, naturally, it was this sort of conceit of the power and specifically that you have to run and like physically evacuate, you know, people from the safe space that ultimately influenced the look and specifically why I ended up taking inspiration from, you know, parkour, fashion, and, like, just uh, that sort of ninja-esque approach. And just, you know, like, I try to keep it somewhat in that first sort of couple designs and something that felt more super heroic. But, like, after a while, I just really kind of went off the rails just doing designs of, like, techware stuff that I've always wanted, again, to use in, a, in something, but I just never had a project um, where... You know, I could just stuff I find that just looks cool. I just think it looks cool, dude, which is what I found so baffling about those designs that came out in 2020 because the artist who created them, Luciano Vecchio, is someone whose work I've been following since like I was 11 years old. And so I, I, I almost didn't like believe that he actually made these because it's just like I can't imagine receiving the design prompt black queer teen and like choosing to go with like. A military buzz cut not even like a lined up or faded cut as opposed to like doing anything with braids or locks or dreads or you know afro <laughs> what and so I, you know obviously you can see that's what i ended up going with you know which is a little hard to to do just because it takes a while but the results speak for themselves i i, I dude it looks so good I, I was so impressed with myself because you know i feel that an important element when it comes to designing black characters is the hair you know if we're talking about representation it's the hair dude you got to get that right uh, another important element jermaine's design was making him look friendly um that's ultimately why i decided to not go with a face covered up look because you know he's, he's the heart of the team man you want to see that big smile you want to get off those vibes that this dude just loves everybody on his team. He, he's what keeps them together. He's the glue. He's the heart. He's the soul. He's the reason why they're even a team to begin with, you know? Um, originally, it was just Snowflake operating on their own, and he ended up tagging along with him. 
and then ends up convincing Trailblazer to join them as it'd be good for her PR. And then when Screen Time shows up and they encounter him, he's the one who advocates for them to keep him, even though the other two both find him incredibly annoying, especially when he does stuff like have a victory floss dance um, after they almost get done being murdered by a supervillain. But instead of getting annoyed at him like they are, he just busts a move and joins him because that's the kind of guy Jermaine is. And gosh, is it hard and not to love that and you know from like a narrative perspective i kind of see him as not really someone who needs to undergo an arc but more that it's his way of being that changes those around him very superman like um just because i love that archetype I i think you can definitely make characters with flat arcs incredibly compelling just through sheer charisma and being able to write a character that's just that damn likable and you know of course you could always try and and do some interesting stuff with making him maybe (laughs) you know a character called safe space who constantly like is throwing himself to protect those he cares about probably doesn't do enough self-care so you know there you go you could do something like that but yeah i mean there you go safe space do you remember how at the beginning of this video i told you that i saw something here that was worth salvaging well the thing i was referring to is this character because Some of you may not remember this, but the original reason why the New Warriors hit the news was not because of how terrible they were. It was because they were going to be debuting the very first trans, non-binary superhero. And while for everyone else this was just a bad book, a bad idea, something that as soon as it stopped being profitable and fun to rag on or be upset about, they could easily forget and move on like it never even existed. For me and the rest of the trans and non-binary community, this is a massive loss. See, even before I gave up my gender to ascend to godhood or recognize that that was something I wanted to do, I understood that this character was going to be quite significant to an entire group of people. I understood that regardless of the intent, whether that was 100% genuine or part of some satirical piece of social commentary, the fact that this character was not only allowed to become the very first non-binary superhero, but the status was actively used as a point of marketing, highlighted a level of hypocrisy on the behalf of those involved in this creation. And I don't just mean the writer and the artist, I mean editorial, the publisher, everybody. Because how can you say you care about representation and put this little effort into a hero this important? A hero destined to be held up in the same regard as Black Panther, Falcon, Shang-Chi, White Tiger, Miss Marvel, Monica Rambeau. A fact that is made more shameful when you realize just how far this falls beneath the bar that the House of Ideas set in 1966 when they introduced the very first black superhero to the world by having him single-handedly defeat their premier team as part of his training. Okay, now that is how you debut a character of this nature with dignity and respect. Hell, even Shang-Chi with their deeply problematic origins had enough sincere care and effort put into him at the start for them to stick around and evolve into something far better than originally conceived that now they even have their own multi-billion dollar movie. Snowflake and the rest of these new warriors on the other hand were so devoid of any redeeming qualities that they'll never see the light of day, forever relegated to only be remembered as a tragic piece of trivia. Welcome back to Top 10 Mojo, did you know that the first non-binary superhero was so shit that it never appeared in an actual comic book? Thank God for Jess Chambers. But this is all to say that the final product of this rework needs to be something befitting of the title and status of the first ever non-binary superhero. And I'm going to start with a very personal change. One that makes the character more relatable to me, but also addresses an issue I kind of have when it comes to queer representation. Which is that I'm going to change their sex, but not their gender. Which, if you didn't understand the non-binary thing before... You should now. And if you don't, just rewatch the whole video. I'm sure you'll get it on the second viewing. <laughs> but the reason I'm doing this is because I myself am AMAB, not binary, and don't really see myself represented in media. By which I mean I just don't see a lot of queer characters in video games or comics or movies or cartoons who were born with a dingling. Probably because that's not as appealing to the straight male gaze. I don't know why. Femboys are awesome. Nonetheless, we're going to change way more than that if we're going to bring this character up to par. So let's continue. Now logic dictates if you're going to make an addition to your pantheon of queer heroes, you might want to like, I don't know, make them stand out by giving them their own unique superpower that isn't like 
the exact same one as maybe your most iconic gay character at the moment because that would be a massive redundancy not to mention that it's just kind of lazy like in this instance snowflake is not referring to like winter weather it's referring to an incredibly fragile and overly sensitive person so how about you come up with a power relating to that like oh i don't know molecular destabilization now ironically enough the best way to help you visualize how this power works is a snowflake or well more like an ice cube when it melts, the molecules inside the cube begin to move, loosening their bonds and breaking the structure. This structure continues to loosen and break as it phases from water into gas. Now imagine if you could do that shit to like... I don't know, anything you touched. Yeah, Brooke can do that. Now a kick-ass power like that needs a kick-ass look to go with it, and honestly... I nailed that shit on the first try. Of course, I did explore alternatives as I think a designer does, but you just can't beat bell bottoms, you know? In all seriousness, I just absolutely love this design. It's my favorite out of the entire batch, and I think that just kind of stems from the fact that it speaks to my own personal fashion sensibilities. I love the collar. I love those big triangular geometric shapes. I had a lot of fun doing the like inking on it with the black and the blue. It's something I've always wanted to do, but again, just never had an opportunity to. And it just, it just all came together very nicely for me. Plus, I think it just does a really good job of visually representing the character. Brooke is incredibly punk rock. They are unabashedly themselves, which is awesome, but also incredibly distressing to their brother because Brooke sees themselves as a fist of vengeance, someone obligated to use their power to deliver punishment upon the scum that choose to prey upon the innocent and defenseless. In a way, they're very much the Batman to Jermaine Superman. And the arc I would imagine for them would very much follow this notion, seeing Snowflake develop from vigilante into an actual hero through the different relationships they would form on the team watching brooke learn more about themselves through these different people slowly becoming more than just some angry kid with a bunch of righteous indignation but something far greater far more powerful more than just some fist of vengeance but a true beacon of hope it's silly but standing back and looking at all this i can't help but feel a level of sorrow because the Marvel Universe has always been a reflection of the world outside our window. And for trans kids, that world is really fucking scary right now. Okay? Like, I'm scared. I'm scared because a 16-year-old girl, let me repeat that, a 16-year-old child, not even old enough to drive, was murdered, stabbed to death in a hate crime, and there was no outcry. No marches, no vigils, no protests, not even a damn hashtag. It's like nobody outside of my community seemed to care. No one seemed to care that Brianna Gay wasn't the only trans child to be murdered recently. Or did Jasmine Kennedy, Jeffrey Bright, Katie Newhouse, and Ariana Mitchell deserve to die because they had pronouns? And that's just on the microcosmic scale. Okay, on the macro? The macro? Tennessee has outlawed Bugs Bunny cartoons, guys. Okay, drag is illegal. But you know, honestly, that's not really that big of a deal when you think that they've straight up banned life-saving healthcare. Because that's what gender-affirming care is, at least according to the American Association of Pediatrics, but like, what the fuck do they know, right? It's not like we're devastating the lives of thousands of children across the nation that we're supposedly trying to protect by passing legislation that will not only prevent them from getting access to vital, medically approved, and most often ignored, but incredibly important reversible gender affirming care but you know outright criminalizing their existence ensuring that these kids will never come out of the closet due to the danger that it would pose to not only them but their families putting these kids in an incredibly high risk of suffering a painful lonely and utterly preventable death because that's where all this leads all right join the 41 percent is an insult to our trans people for a reason but no i don't know what i'm talking about i'm just a sensitive little snowflake who wants attention and special treatment instead of a regular human being just advocating for their existence <sighs> i recognize that a lot of how those outside the community are seeing our current struggle right now has to do with perception and the truth is that our perception is not great it's not great because anytime someone like me comes up the only people who get heard either hate us and want us all dead or are not very good at advocating for me. And I shouldn't have to advocate for me. I shouldn't have to advocate for my friends and my loved ones, especially when my existence poses no threat to anybody else. But that's just the world we live in. And you know what maybe would have helped with that perception? The perception that trans people are only predatory, degenerate men 
and confused women is maybe if we got a book from the largest franchise in the world right now about a kid who just wants to live a regular, normal, happy, healthy life, but can't because other people are threatened by the difference in their human experience. Telling stories of them experiencing the exact same nightmare so many kids are currently facing right now and overcoming it and fighting back. But instead we get this. And that's heartbreaking because you know what? I believe in the power of heroes. I believe in the real impact these stories can have, the hope and comfort they can provide, the lessons they can impart, and the way they can inspire us. After all, these heroes weren't just made to be role models for us, they were modeled after us. The best part of us, our shared desire to do what's right, to protect the innocent, to fight against injustice, to save lives, and to build a better world for all of us. Now, I may have originally created this video to release on Trans Day of Visibility, but you know what? Every day you have the opportunity to do what's right. Every day you have the opportunity to stand up against tyranny. Every day you have the opportunity to protect the vulnerable. So today I'm encouraging you to go out there and embrace the very best part of yourself and to be a hero to those who need it the most. Because no matter how bad things are right now, I still believe in you. Thanks for watching.